platform. And we spent the last year or so um, working on um, kind of modernizing and streamlining some of the operations involved with operating and deploying the platform. So I'm going to take a few minutes and just talk about some of that here, uh, because um, I think it's applicable to some of the things that the um, people on this channel are are doing with users and, and their own work. So um, if you're not familiar with Agave, it's a multi-tenant platform as a service, it, or the science as a service, we like to say, um, to hybrid cloud environments, meaning um, you can deploy it on-premise. We have a hosted version. You can also kind of mix and match. We can operate part. You can operate part. You can scale out uh, more or less elastically um, like a normal cloud cloud application does. Um, you can think of Agave like a Salesforce for science, but um, we're not really selling anything, and there's really nothing that we're selling. So um, it's really just a, uh, a platform that you can um, pick up and use and white label for your own purposes. Agave does four things, uh, manage data, run code, um, allows you to collaborate anywhere and really connect just about anything. Um, it's an API, a RESTful API platform, uh, designed from the ground up API first, and um, has a lot of uh, flexibility for you to add your own services and and expand. Um, previously, uh, well, really up until about a year ago, we'd been um, deploying it as um, you know, more or less a, a cloud native application, but we've been handling um, a lot of the, the details ourselves. So it, it was true that you could deploy entirely in um, in any cloud. Uh, we we'd done. Uh, POCs and, and production deployments with a lot of different folks um, on, on all the major cloud providers, as well as various flavors of OpenStack, as well as your own self-hosted infrastructure. Um, we uh, collaboratively managed a few different tenants as well. And that was all fine. We had uh, Ansible automation for everything, but there were some pain points in there, right? So we had a whole host of settings, um, lots of lots of knobs that you could twist and turn to. Um, to tweak the performance and behavior to make it fit in all these different environments, uh, because it, you know, as much as you, you try to generalize this stuff, everything turns into a snowflake at, at some point. So um, the, uh, the Ansible automation became um, a little bit complicated. Uh, we had a ton of documentation written um, that you know every reader absolutely read from start to finish because you know users love doing that. Uh, but it was a rather complex configuration matrix. And um, there's just a lot of stuff that you needed to know. Um, if you're gonna go start uh, wading into the waters of, of operating and, and maintaining distributed systems, there's you know just a, a learning curve that you have to go through to understand uh, basic things like, hey, I, I want high availability, right? I wanna go from, um, uh, uh, I wanna go from um, a single host deployment to a high availability setup. Well, you're not going from one to two, you're going from uh, probably one to five, right? And stuff like that just, didn't grok well with people that hadn't been exposed to it before. So there's some of that. Thus, there's also day two operations, right? Once you had a um, an instance up and running, um, scaling it was still a manual process. Uh, we had a lot of playbooks to help with it, but it was still something that you kind of had to understand and know. And then lots more configure options and um, then monitoring and logging. Everyone has their own in-house solution that they're using for their data center. So um, people had to, to uh, wire that stuff up and independently. Um, which meant that we couldn't just ship dashboards out of the box because, well, you know, we, we didn't have every available um, solution and we didn't have that much manpower. So there was always um, a lot of uh, friction, right? It wasn't just stand it up and, and run it and forget about it. It was always, hey, you probably need to think about having like a, a quarter FTE um, to operate this infrastructure for, you know, your organization. Um, not the worst thing, but it was still something to be aware of. Um, so. We fought it for a long time um, because we didn't want to replace one distri complicated distributed system um, with another one. Um, but uh, eventually, it just became the juice became worth the squeeze. So we, we started the process of migrating over to uh, Kubernetes, and we spent um, about a, a year doing that. And, and the goals were pretty simple, right? We wanted to, to get rid of a lot of our homegrown automation. We wanted to pay down our technical debt. And we wanted to leverage a lot of the things that Kubernetes did really well and that were uh, persistent across um, distros and across uh, um, flavors of, of Kubernetes. So um, we wanted to uh, switch to Helm. We wanted to make sure that things would auto scale. We wanted to make sure that um, the system was smart enough to kind of right size itself and figure out where it needed to be and um, how it needed to adjust. And then we wanted to, to make um, 
um, upgrades and uh, the insights, right? The, the logging metrics, um, alerting notifications, just the transparency of the system um, ship out of the box. So um, like I said, we spent about, about a year doing that. Um, along the way, we, uh, we had to work our way through six different releases of Kubernetes, um, three different distributions of, of Kubernetes um, itself, you know, different versions of Minikube, uh, micro KDS when um, we were working on Ubuntu originally, and then um, Cube Spray, right? Kind of pushing the, um, uh, pushing it in that a lot of the edge cases there. Uh, we we're deploying across five different operating systems and and four different clouds as we kind of made our way trying to figure out what was going to work and what was going to port. Um, turns out, uh, just because it runs in one distro doesn't mean it's necessarily going to run in another. There there are a lot of gotchas. Um, we tried this really more of a, a journey than a destination. Uh, we really had to find out a lot more about um, our application itself and how it was going to behave in these situations, but also about um, some of the, the gotchas that the individual um, cloud providers and open tech distros had. So um, we, uh, we spent the last few months getting um, everything working on OpenStack, um, specifically on, on the Jetstream cloud. And just OpenStack generally, there were some things that, that we just weren't really um, looking at um, initially. So there was just a, a lot of variation, right? That just even between releases, right? And a lot of you guys know this, if you're if you're shipping SDKs or you're shipping software on, on top of OpenStack, um, the, uh, the regression testing is is pretty good, but there's there's always stuff that, that jumps up and gets you, right? So you kind of have to stay aware of, of what's available and what's not. Um, not just in the the APIs and the tooling, but in the the instances of, of OpenStack itself, right? The the services that are available, you know, how they deployed, what they chose to include, and what they didn't. Um, what's GA? What's you know alpha? All that stuff is um, is under a, a lot of variance from from site to site. So really need to be aware of that. And then we needed to um, understand that there was a minimum set of functionality that we could count on. And the rest was going to have to be something that, that we got much, much smarter about. So we started working on that for, um, for a good period of time um, and realized that it was better for us to scale back a lot of what we were doing um, rather than, than leveraging some of the, rather than trying to, to take our technical debt down to, to zero. That just wasn't going to be possible in a portable way. So um, we had to roll some of our own infrastructure. Uh, we could still roll it on top of Kubernetes, but it has some implications, right? So things like load balancing, DNS, um, your certificate uh, management, rotation, um, how you're dealing with stateful applications like databases and things, um, your uh, storage solutions, um, your monitoring your, uh, of your hosts and the, uh, the support services, all that stuff was things that we really had to, to start looking at, um, taking into consideration and providing for ourselves just to, to guarantee the quality of service that, that we wanted. Um, storage was also a big one, um, specifically on, on Jetstream, just because um, uh, they have Manila there. Manila was not super um, super rock solid for us. So we had to, to work around um, a lot of issues with latency, um, connections dropping, uh, blowing out the, the number of connections that we could actually have at any given time, um, mounts disappearing just really fun stuff right um so we we reined back our, our expectations a little bit and, and looked at other ways uh, specifically deploying um a bunch of extra block storage um to the host and then uh, just altering the, the architecture to work around some of the things that we otherwise would have done if we had a uh, you know distributed storage system um let's see other things uh oh um lack of ssd right if you're if you're running kubernetes on uh, really anything. Uh, Kubernetes kind of works with the assumption that there's, I mean, the services work best with the assumption that there's SSD underneath. Um, you can do it without, but you start running into a lot of issues when you start um, scaling out, when you put the, the services under load. Um, even when you're load balancing, you're properly on outside of, of Kubernetes and then um, taking advantage of the, um, the local replication proxy inside the cluster. Um, you can push the APIs over um, fairly easily if, if your queries back to etcd aren't quick. So that was something that we really had to adjust and, and really um, took us away from being able to do any kind of uh, functions as a service. Um, also, uh, don't use flannel. 
Uh, you'll like your life a whole lot better if you just completely avoid flannel um, for your, your networking plugin in, um, in OpenStack. It, it was horrendous for us. But that's about uh, all I really wanted to, uh, to cover here. I, I will say that at the end of the day, um, the juice was worth the squeeze, um, but there was just a whole lot of information and experience that we gathered along the way. So um, if you have any questions, over, feel free to, to ask. Um, you can um, reach us at all the usual suspects, and these links will be posted in the Etherpad. Thanks.